Um, so you got me there. The unions give money to the Democrats. Um, so am I? Am Are I you angry about that? I mean, does it upset you as much as you know bankers giving money to Republicans? No, no. Cor the corporations give way more than the unions. Uh, so it's not just corporations. That's, okay. That's not That's really okay. true. okay. Look it up. You can Google it. It's really easy. Um, so. Do I object to taking out union money from politics? Hell no, I don't object. Take it all out. Take the union money out. Take the corporate go uh, money out. Take all the big money out. They're supposed to represent us and not the donors, no matter who the donors are. So in terms of the question that you asked, Glass-Steagall, well, aren't they investing in things? Okay. I'm thinking about this right now in this... And I do agree there with Senk, the Jankmaster. I do agree there. If you're going to take the money out of politics, then you know what? On both sides. Get rid of the huge amounts of money if you want to do it. I, I think I'm for that as well. Absolutely. Because politics, the representatives that we sent there, we do vote for them. But once they get there, whose control are they under? For the next two years, for the next six years of senatorship, you know, for House of Representative two, Senate six, President four, obviously. When they're there and they become entrenched as an incumbent, they get the power, the resources, the money. They stop representing us because we just don't have the influence as a singular entity, as one person. Yes, but how can we get that power as corporations do? We just can't. So I agree with Sank on this part. Let's continue and see what else he has to say. No, uh, I have a literal answer for you. Oftentimes what they do is financial derivatives. In fact, that's the majority of what they do. And financial derivatives is simply gambling. That's what crashed the 2008 economy. And, and, what is so damaging about the removal of Glass-Steagall is now they could do their financial derivative gambling with depositor money. Boy, isn't that nice. They take your money and they gamble with it. And if they lose, well, that's a sad day for you. But if they win, they keep the profits. You know what that is? That's privatizing the gains and socializing the losses. So it's not, it's not that the banks are evil. Of course they're not evil. It's just that they're driven to make more money. Of course, that is the whole point of maximizing profit. So That's a whole idea of being a bank is to make money. But I will agree with, uh, again, a little surprise here, with the Senkmeister, that in terms of them doing the derivatives and mortgage-backed securities and whatever, but again, that was an investment that they utilized that they thought they were, they weren't going into it thinking we're going to lose money on this. They thought this was a great way to quadruple, quintuple our profits. Mortgage-backed securities bundle everything together. There are investors out there, of course, that want to buy it. They bought them. Banks made some money. When the crash happened, well, guess what? The banks lost some big-time money, and so did investors. But you know what? The, in this regard... Banks are, like he said, bank, of course banks aren't evil, but they're designed to make money. They're designed to make a profit. And then they use that profit to lend back out into society, lend back for startups, lend back to corporations to create new businesses, new products, new services, more jobs, and hopefully increase the bottom line and do the same thing. Rinse, lather, repeat. Rinse, lather, repeat. So if we say, hey, banks, you're allowed to go and buy politicians, although the Supreme Court would say, no, they're just talking to them. Don't buy another pair of glass. Them billions of dollars, they're just having a conversation, right? Just because they gave them billions of dollars, they don't, do they want something in return? Of course they want something in return. And that's our money. So what they got, it, it, what they got was, Laws passed by politicians to remove Glass-Steagall, and yes, Clinton and Gingrich, yes, both parties are guilty on that, but now the Democrats want to put it back and the Republicans don't, and they, they took our depositor money and they gambled with it. And if you thought 
that if you gambled, you get to keep all the profits. And if you lost, it didn't affect you at all. You would probably gamble a lot of money too. And you would take a lot of risk until you crashed the economy. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so, so, uh, so ben, let me just add one piece wanna, of this question. You'll respond to it too. You've talked a lot about the corruption in politics. Mm -hmm. And a core part of the Trump campaign was railing against the establishment, which he thought was corrupted. And a lot of the big donors were initially against him. So which way is the Republican Party going to go on this? Is it Trumpism and the grassroots movement or the establishment? Well, I mean, I, when it comes to money and politics, I think that, that that breakdown doesn't really hold. I mean, the fact is that, that President Trump during the campaign talked routinely about how he engaged in, in putting money into politics. So, I mean, this is a game that a lot of people are playing. It's, it's kind of a weird question. But uh, as far as the idea that all money should be out of politics, here is the problem. Okay, TYT, I, we both have corporations and we expound upon politics every single day. And we motivate thousands of people, right, every day on both sides of the aisle. That is effectively an in-kind contribution. Now, I, you campaigned with Bernie Sanders. Did you do it because you expected, that's fine. Did you expect, did you do that because you supported Bernie Sanders or did you do that because you expected some gimme for TYT in return? I assume no. you did it because you supported Bernie Sanders, right? Yes. So, yes, okay. So, the point that I am making is to attribute to everyone else bad intent when it comes to political spending and politics, but to yourself, it's totally fine. And when it comes to other media entities that give in-kind contributions on a regular basis through their coverage, this is... When the New York Times, when the New York Times, which is biased to the left, spends an inordinate amount of time and money reporting on Mitt Romney's idiotic stories about how he was in high school and cutting a gay kid's hair in 1932, if you're saying to me that that is less impactful on the political sphere than a corporation, which is a group giving money to a, to a political candidate for purposes of supporting that candidate, I fail to see how you can say for yourself that you are innocent in this, but everyone else is guilty. I don't believe that. Either everyone's guilty or everybody is innocent, or if you can find the actual cases of guilt where there's a quid pro quo, then we agree. That's prosecutable, right? Yes. So. Uh, other point, when you talked about the 2008 economy, you talked about Glass-Steagall and how this led to the crash. The real reason that the crash happened had far less to do with Glass-Steagall. I opposed the bailouts, by the way. It had far less to do with Glass-Steagall than it had to do with the fact that the federal government was actively promulgating the notion that corporations should give subprime mortgages to people who are not qualified as, as people who could take out loans. This meant that, as you say, Corporations are not inherently conservative, they're not inherently free market, they're inherently profit driven. So if they felt that they could give a bunch of subprime mortgages and this would inflate the real estate prices and if things went wrong, they just foreclose on the nearest house and the market just keeps going up and up and up and they can just, as you say, turn these into derivatives and sell them on the open market by pretending that these are all good loans because they have government backing, then of course you're going to get an inflated, overheated real estate market. But the question there is not the workings of the free market, it's the, it's the combination that you like in a mixed economy, that I hate. Okay, I hate mixed economies in the sense that I don't believe that capitalism and socialism should be mixed, that corporatism is the solution. Okay, what you're talking about is corporatism. You're talking about Glass-Steagall, which, which freed the, the, the getting rid of Glass-Steagall, it freed the corporations to invest in a free market manner, but also they gave a bailout to all of these corporations by essentially incentivizing them to give a bunch of bad loans, knowing that if things went bad, then all the losses would be socialized. The problem there is not the free market. The problem there is a government that is acting as a backstop for bad decisions in the free market by profit-driven corporations. Wow, wow, wow. Points to Ben Shapiro on that one, folks. I mean, you know, Sank the Jankmeister thought he had him inside there, but then Ben just rattled it off, right? One by one by one. Hit, you know, or Siegel basically attacked that one. Banks, in terms of money driven, it wasn't the banks thing, it was the laws passed by government, it was the mortgage backed security derivatives. It was the uh, it was during the Clinton administration where they basically told banks, hey, you've got to loan to underprivileged people, to minorities. And if they can't afford those or if they're not even at the level of, um, you know, uh, you know, credit worthiness, it doesn't matter. You've got to do it in your community. If you don't, we're going to find you. So what do the banks do? Oh, you're going to back me? That it's going to be a government-backed mortgage security? Okay, fine. If the loan goes south, like you said, we'll foreclose on it. And the bank and the government will cover it. It's a no-brainer. So, as he said, mixed economies. Ben saying, I don't want to mix capital with socialism. Sink, you do. And these are the problems that are caused when you try to have government controls be put in place that force 
private institutions to do the bidding of government. And then when the things hit the fan, government says, hey, not our fault. It's yours. You're in the private sector. You're the evil ones. This point, counterpoint, went to Ben Shapiro. Okay. All right, I love that. There was a lot to respond to there, so let me try to take it one at a time. Um, so first off, I love the idea that uh, the government made the banks do the subprime mortgages. And golly gee, the government twists the bank's arm and no, they, they made billions upon incentive. billions of dollars. Oh man, oh don't make me make another billion. Don't make me make another billion. No, they did those. If they thought they were going to lose money off of it, they would have a fiduciary responsibility not to do it. I agree. Okay, it, it was they were not forced to make billions of dollars. They were not forced to then have us bail them out. Right. They did all of that because there's legalized bribery in America. Right, because okay. the government was giving them money. So, Correct. so now let me address that. You say, well, what's the difference between uh, your speech and their speech? Mine is actually speech, and theirs is money. <laughs> so there's a giant difference. Uh, you spend money on so, your speech. So first off. So they say, uh, no, no, Supreme Court uh, says, no, money is speech now. No, money is property. It's not speech. And so if, if money was speech, well, then if you go to a hooker and you say, oh, no, uh, officer, I was just talking to her. Okay. <laughs> money is not speech. So, for example, to give you a sense of it, to compare me saying I like Bernie Sanders and you saying whoever you like is the equivalent of this is obviously nonsensical. I believe it's obvious. So... In a five-year, recent five-year period, uh, the top 200 corporate givers, uh, they both in donations and in lobbying, spent $5.8 billion, okay? So that is not the same thing as me saying, hey, I like what Bernie's saying about college and Medicare. And, and when they did, why do you think they did? It was not because, hey, they genuinely like Bernie or Trump or Hillary. Because in return for that $5.8 billion, they got $4.4 trillion in government subsidies. So, which leads, which leads to, I actually think, the biggest point here, the difference between big government and small government. So, a, a lot of times conservatives say, oh, you guys like big government. That's not true. So, let me explain. We, if I ask you, hey, you got a plumbing job, what would you like, big pipes or small pipes? I don't know. What's the job we have? It depends. It's the same thing with the government. Okay, what size government would you like? I don't know. What's the job we have? So to say big government or small government doesn't make any sense. So, for example, do I want a big government that invades Iraq? Hell no, I don't. No way. And, and Ben, you were vociferously for the Iraq war. So in that sense, you love the big government. Couldn't get enough of it. And I could go on and on and on. Republicans say, no, 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 we don't like big government, but we'd like to be inside your uterus. So just admit it. It's no problem. Just say it. Say I love big government, it's okay. So you're talking about when you like tax, when, when you're rich and you want tax codes. Oh no, I don't want big government, I want small government. But when it's convenient for you and you'd like oil subsidies and you'd like wars and you'd like to meddle in people's private lives, then you love big government. Okay, so the, I need to respond to some of that. This whole thing that Senk is talking about, you know what, oh, if we had a plumbing job, and, you know, they came over, I said, well, what size pipes do you need? Large pipes? I don't know. What type of job is it? Well, then that's, you know, it depends. And he applied the same thing to big government, you know. So in certain things, you're going, you want big government. In other things, you want small government. The point that he's trying to make is, is that it shouldn't be one size fits all. Now the question becomes is, who's going to decide it always goes back to that point. Who's going to decide in terms of, you know, what policies are going to partake with the big government? What policies are going to be with the small government? And is it just going to be like it is right now? Where certain things, okay, the government comes in and basically some people feel it's an intrusion on your private life and others, others feel that there's not enough intrusion into the private life? 
I mean, that's a question that, but now going to the money part of it, all that money, regardless of where it goes to, that huge piles of money, it's going to get favors and services and policies that you want, whether it's a big policy and big type government, or it could be a smaller policy because to each every individual that wants something to them, that's big. If you're working on a large project, that's important to you. If you're working on a small project, that's important to you. If you're getting money for a large project, that's important to you. If you're getting a small amount of money for your small project, that's important to you. So what Sink is saying here, I mean, it's sort of like a circular argument. Okay, so what? Big government, small government. What we want is less government. That's, I think, the better question is, where can we have less government? Not big or small. Anyways, let's continue. <laughs> 